What happened to that sweet little girl who you've loved and nurtured for more than a decade? Who is this irrational, untidy and moody young woman living in your house who seems to find everything about you so embarrassing? Today, I have a really interesting and wide-ranging discussion with parenting columnist Lorraine Candy about how to survive the challenges of parenting teenage girls. We cover topics ranging from why teenage girls are so mean to their mums, how to connect with them, dealing with their untidy bedrooms, picking your battles, managing their screen time and being a mother during the menopause. Hi, I'm neuroscientist Dr Ben Webb and I want to help you cultivate a healthy brain for a mentally healthy and happy life. Welcome to episode 43 of Better Brain, Better You. Hello there, I hope you've had a great week and I'm really pleased you could join me for today's episode on the challenges of parenting teenage girls with Lorraine Candy. So if you're watching on YouTube, please like, subscribe and hit that notification bell to hear when we release new videos. And thanks so much for listening in wherever you get your podcasts. We release weekly episodes for brains of all ages. But before we get started, I want to give you a free workshop on how to parent a teenage brain. On the workshop, we share the four essential strategies for parenting teenagers to help you resolve common teenage problems, connect with your teenager, influence teenage behaviour and support a teenager's mental health. So if you've tried to connect with your teen- teenager but found it really difficult to resolve their problems and worries that they might struggle with every day, whether it's emotional outbursts, too much screen time, disrupted sleep, risky behaviours or mental health challenges, then this workshop will definitely be helpful. You can watch this free workshop at ologyonlinecourses.com forward slash workshop. That's ologyonlinecourses.com forward slash workshop. Please do go and watch the workshop. It's packed full of our best content and some really effective parenting strategies. Okay, so today I'm going to talk to Lorraine Candy about her forthcoming book, Mum, What's Wrong With You? 101 Things Only Your Mothers or Girls Know. A genuinely warm, funny and well-informed guide for mothers on how to navigate the perfect storm of parenting teenage girls. Journalist, editor open water swimmer and mother of four Lorraine has been writing for more than a decade about parenting and family life she also co-hosts the fabulous postcards for midlife podcast supporting and inspiring women at this at this stage of life by addressing everything from perimenopause to HRT to parenting teens welcome to the podcast Lorraine hi Ben how are you I'm good delighted to have you here so you grew up in Southeast Cornwall, and I've I've read and you talk fondly of your kind of youth during summer holidays spent on the North Cornwall beaches, swimming in the sea with your sister, and now you say you spend most summer holidays back there in Cornwall with your husband and your four kids. So Cornwall and its connections to the sea sounds like a really a really important place for you. Yeah, I think it's I'm I'm I sort of consider it my home Cornwall. It's my home. You know, I live in London now, and I've lived in London since I was uh, sixteen. So just 17 I think yeah so but I actually Cornwall is my you know it's kind of the place to refresh your soul I guess and my family is still there so we go back a lot you're a surfer and open water swimmer (laughs) it's a loose description surfer I think (laughs) that's my life's work learning to surf quite frankly but um, I swim in cold water so and again I just it is a recreational thing I'm not a competitive swimmer at all I just swim quite slowly Sometimes in a wetsuit, but mostly not in cold water. I've just found it so beneficial to me, particularly in, in midlife. And actually, as we talk about a lot in the podcast, as I went through perimenopause, it was a real saviour for my mental health, actually. There's also good evidence that actually now, isn't there, for, for the benefits of cold water swimming? For... Well, there's nothing definitive, but there's a lot of research going on to it. And certainly the community around it, you know, being in nature... Um, And there is actually just some evidence that it might um, help prevent dementia. There was a study done on uh, at Alida where I swim actually, which which there's a protein in the brain that is um, released if you frequently cold water swim. You're very acclimatized, apparently, and they're researching that. So and that, you know, and obviously 
Alzheimer's is the, is the number one killer of women over 40. So, um, you know, it's a big piece of work going on that. Okay. And they seem, the open water swimming, swimming community seem like a, seem like a lovely bunch and it's, it's a sort of female group you swim with it. It's very welcoming. And I, I, you know, I've written about this a lot and it, it, my experiences and I swim in lakes here as well, Shepparton Lake in Surrey is that it's a, it's a welcoming community and it's a, it's a big community of women in midlife as well. It's also, you know, it's something you can do on your own. You don't have to be amazing at it. You don't need a ton of gadgets to do it. Um, and you can do it all year round. Um, you know, I meet a lot of people who are recovering from lots of mental health issues, open water swimming. I've just, I've just found it so supportive and, you know, it's really, I find it very good fun. I mean, that, that first few moments when you go in and you wonder what the hell you're doing and why on earth you're doing it um, are a bit odd. But after that, it's just the, the, the ripple effect for the week for me is, is great, actually. And just, I know uh, one thing that uh, uh, a connection for us is that I did a big cycle around Lake Geneva and I, did, I said you did a big swim there, did you? A, a competitive swim. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I guess that was a midlife crisis situation. We, uh, when I learnt to do front crawl outside, and um, when I was about forty-five, I'm fifty-two now. Um, I just loved the swimming so much. I, we thought we would, we would tackle a big swim. Where would the water be amazing to swim? We thought, well, Geneva would be pretty amazing. Um, and probably we didn't do as much research as we, as we could have done. But it's seventy kilometres. Geneva is twice the channel. It's like swimming to France and back. And we did it in a relay. Um, we did it with our swimming coach so he's very fast and we were quite slow but it was yeah it took us 30 hours we swam through the night it was quite I think it was a life-changing extraordinary adventure it was you know we had to train for it we had to save up for it we had to get sponsorship you know there were six of us we worked really well together on doing it we did a lot of social media around it and you know we're not fast swimmers but we're, we're, we're adequate now but um it really was yeah it was kind of it's something you never forget in life when you do something like that. It was a real focus for us. Amazing. And cold, I bet. Geneva's quite cold, yeah. <laughs> it's so big, it's really cold. Um, but we didn't fancy the channel because we just thought, you know, it's seawater, it's a shipping channel, it's mucky. It's not as, it won't be as nice as uh, uh, Geneva. But I think Geneva is probably colder, actually, because it's a lake, it's still water. It's slightly tidal because of the, the rivers coming into it. But yeah, it was cold. But we did, you know, we were acclimatised. We swam through the winter so that our bodies could deal with it. But um, I couldn't do it now. I'm not acclimatised now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you, your history, you know, very well known fashion editor of some very well-known magazines, um, Elle and Cosmopolitan, and then went on to be editor-in-chief at the Times for, their, for, for fashion. And have you always written about um, family and parenting, or was that just something that obviously you wrote about once that became an important part of your life? Yeah, no, I haven't always written, but I started as a journalist. I worked on, you know, I worked as a news reporter for many years before I moved into magazines um, and a woman's editor on both broadsheet and tabloid. But um, I started writing about parenting about, I think, about 12 years ago. Um, I had a column in Female, a weekly column in Female. And then when I moved to the Sunday Times, I had a column in the magazine, which was the female column was about our life, a kind of humorous take on our life when they were younger. And then obviously you can't put that kind of detail around teenagers. Um, it's not fair to do that because of their privacy. So I, my, the column moved into talking to experts about parenting teenagers because it was just a very different, a very different experience from <laughs> parenting younger children, as you know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what I, what I really loved about your book, and it, this is the the absolute truth, is so it contains advice for parents and teens, but it's, you know, it's based on rigorous, well, lots of it's based on kind of rig what I know to be rigorous psychology and neuroscience, but packaged in warm, relatable stories and ane anecdotes that really, really resonated with you. Was that, was that, was that your intention to package, package the book that way? Yeah. I think I felt having read so many of these books and interviewed so many people that as mums, you are, you know, and this is my pertinent to my experience, so I'm not, I have to generalise to that extent. As mums, you're often just being told what to do all the time. And it's, a, it's just another pressure to 
be told you know do this and then your child won't get this or won't do that and it felt like a lot of the books are just constantly helping us solve a problem as parents and actually what I wanted to do was something a little bit more comforting and reassuring and to give some personal experience to make everyone feel they weren't alone that you know and every every teenager is different everyone develops at a different stage and some things may work for your eldest teens but they might not work for your number two teen or three teen they might work for certain personalities they might and I just didn't think there was a book out there that would reassure parents without giving them a massive to-do list of stuff that they you know that they'd have to we're a generation brought up on that Gina Ford book of you know putting babies into routines and solving problems and it just felt to me that this is really unhelpful for most mums because they just don't know what to do. And actually, a lot of it is so simple <laughs> and so easy for you to do as a parent. And, you know, a lot of it you already know as a parent. Um, and we're being bombarded at the moment as well with lots of headlines about the terrible state of mental health of our teens, which I think parents find really, really frightening. And, you know, this is not a book for families in extreme circumstances. You need to go to an expert for that. This is a book to reassure ordinary mums every day that they're doing the best they can and also to make sure you take care of your own mental health your own sense of who you are because if you don't do that then you really can't you know it's hard caring for teenagers and it is a bit shocking how they are and the risks they take and the things they do and, and also the thing that I found very pertinent to mums is they're quite mean to you um, they're quite mean to mums um, and they're not as mean to dads generally speaking so teenage girls and of course they're not because they don't you know then he's not their role model in the same way that mothers are so I just thought I would acknowledge that and say it's normal and you, you know there there are things you can do and you know don't sweat the small stuff and relax a little bit around it I think it's once you know and you, and you have the sort of guidance and you know and supportive advice that you offer in the book then it does become simpler but it's incredibly challenging, isn't it, for so for so many parents? And what, well, and I, one thing that really jumped out at me is again, not really. I mean, obviously, with the work we do, I've read lots of parenting teenage books. So I haven't seen this that often. Something which is really, really important for actually trying to connect with teenagers. Something you you mentioned in earlier in one of your early chapters is this notion of because we all want to jump in and try and solve their problems for them, but actually. One of the best ways, and it's a little bit counterintuitive and certainly counterintuitive for men, I think, is actually to sit with them and listen, right, to their to to their to their concerns, their worries, their problems, rather than jumping in with solutions. Yeah, I think active listening, as they call it in therapy, is an incredibly useful skill and it's not one we all have. I think, you know, actually it's a very good point you make. I think dads don't have that skill quite so much certainly of my generation because they're problem solvers they're doing they want to sort it out and that's what they've been used to doing for their uh, daughters up until the teenage point and actually just what we call pot plant parenting being in the room and listening to them w without judging them or criticizing them side by side is, is is actually it feels like the most ineffective thing in the world because <laughs> you're not solving anything or curing anything but you're just listening that, to them telling you all of the things and you know sometimes they tell you things which are ho horrifying and frightening and worrying but that being able to be listened to and I spoke to lots of teenage girls actually in the research for the book and um, I spoke to lots of journalists who'd spent a lot of time with teenage girls that being a letting mum listen to you seemed to be the thing that really helped them made them feel safe reassured comforted you know they they were almost talking to themselves but you were there listening to them as well and, and not in any way offering to sort it out i think that's there's also an element of you know if you if you if you try and solve things they're just making stuff happy making you happy and that's an added pressure in the life of a teenage girl trying to keep their mum happy as well and you need to relieve them of that pressure i think I mean, they often worry, don't they? well, not worried that they might be concerned that you're trying to solve the problem for them rather than they might want to solve it themselves. And it's a real, you know, I mean, it's, it's great to see it in your book because it's a real skill. I think it's something it's not, it's not completely intuitive, I think, a lot of the time to do that, you know, as, as a parent, because you just want to make them better, don't you? Well, you sort of want to protect yourself from sad, terrible feelings as well. And I think that's going on subconsciously, perhaps. You, you don't want to feel awful about what they're telling you. You don't want to take it personally, feel like you've failed uh, in some way, especially when they tell you things that, you know, you know are going to upset you. And you don't want to, you know, if you have to solve it for them, then it undermines their or their confidence around solving stuff for themselves. But it is a really 
it's a really hard skill and, of, and often I find you you're very one is very tempted to offer your own experience back as, as um, sympathy almost and they do, they don't want sympathy or sometimes they don't even want empathy they just want to know to be heard and sometimes they just want to say it out loud so it makes more sense so they can their brain can unscramble it for them um, I just try not to step I try to count to five and not step in when they're telling me things and just let let, let it all <laughs> come out and, and you know they have to make really big mistakes that's what they have to do in order to learn from it absolutely yeah and that's I think that's hard for a, as a parent so um, another thing that you know with the work that we do and the and the parents that I work with and talk to you know in, on the podcast and in, in, in life generally is really struggling to know the best ways to actually try and connect with their teenagers because often once they make that transition from tw tw you know early preteen to tween into, into the teenage years they can suddenly disappear from your life you know and they will just hold up in that uh, hold up in their bedroom and, you, and and no one and no one to talk to but you had some some good advice in there as well about a good a good good strategies for how to connect with them and the best time to connect with them yeah, I think there are some rituals that you've started all the way through your parenting that you can gently continue. Um, I'm a big fan of eating together once a week without any phones. I think a lot of teenagers eat in their room on their own and I think you've got to make quite an effort to get them out and you should make that effort to keep that connection. Listening to music together it sounds bonkers but actually that um, there's a lot of research particularly with families in crisis um, around listening to music together with you just being you know listening to their music with them and I think walks having a dog really helped us connect with them it's just every single day actively curiously observing them and thinking where can I connect with them today but it's not saying we're all going to go and do this. We're all going to go and do that. It's finding out what they want to watch on telly and sitting next to them while they're watching it, even if you don't want to watch it. It's just taking time to really observe those moments where you could be in there connecting with them, not doing anything or asking anything or judging anything or criticising. It's making them a cup of tea and taking it into their room and putting it, you know, next to all the other empty cups of tea that's stored in there for forevermore, <laughs> you know, stepping over all the wet towels. You know, it's buying them the small things that they seem to like that they may you don't may not disagree you may disagree with them eating it or doing it it's really tiny things actually which most of the therapists I talk to just show the connection and and that connection can get stronger it's very hard to keep that connection with teenagers because they're just simply not there as you as you say but there are moments when they come in and they really need to talk to you I found that my teenagers really often really need to talk to me very late at night and I'd have to really think, you know, you'd have to stay up, you'd have to be around just in case they wanted to have a chat. And it's just the small things that really do set a different pattern. And that's that can keeping a connection is a, is a very, very strong way of keeping your teenagers happy mentally, I think. Um, but you don't have to overthink it. Yeah, absolutely. We have this term in the work we do, this sort of connection before correction. There's kind of notion that you, you, you know, to, to, to try and help them and guide them, you need to be there. If you're not already connected, it's very hard to actually help and support them, you know, when things do, when th things do come up, you know, and it's good to just be, as you say. Yeah, I think we're very busy as a generation as well. I think we, you know, we'd, we're always doing something. And sometimes I think just being in the house when they're in the house and them knowing that is really important. And I do make the point, because a lot of um, therapists talk to me about it, that, that we probably have to slow down as parents a bit and just be around a bit more in their teenage years. It makes a massive difference to them. And that's, a, you know, we've got to make the decision not to be quite so busy all the time. You know, all the things we do, where is the gap to spend some time with them, but not to spend time with them doing things or asking things of them, to just be around them. Something, something we should... Uh... I loved and also found amusing in your book something I struggle with hugely as a parent and I know my I know my partner does as well is this is their bedrooms and the tidiness or lack or lack of tidiness <laughs> yes I know it's so funny it seems to cause so much trouble for people I loved your advice which is I think I think we would and I know lots of the parents we work with we struggle with that but it's good it's good advice was was it to close the door and you know walk away 
just walk away from it like a crime scene just close the door and pass by go and do something else find something else to occupy you know you can pick up the cups you can pick up the stuff all over the floor but you can't you know I do know some parents whose, whose teens are quite tidy but you just it's not your place and it's just when you do that sort of which bit should I get cross about that's just not the bit to get cross about I don't think and and it's a god awful mess I mean it's in some kids one of my teenagers is so untied it just it's a terrible mess but actually I think and you'll know this that they from a neurological point of view they just don't see it it doesn't register as something in their brain to to deal with it just registers in your brain because you have an adult brain that's already formed and, and understands the importance of being able to find a pencil if it's exam revision time and all of that but they just don't it doesn't bother them in the way that it bothers you so my advice and, and everyone I spoke to just I wanted to double check and double is just to ignore it and shut the door I did notice that in America I'm on a lot of forums for American parents they take the door off as a form of punishment which feels to me like the worst kind of horrific invasion of privacy cruelty and, and, and you know this is not your that isn't their room it's not your place um you know we step in every now and again when we feel it's unhygienic or we think the dog might eat something that will kill it but you know generally i just think keep that door shut and don't go in there um because they don't see it so it doesn't bother them but it just bothers you they don't see it and it's incredibly important because that you know that it's they're trying to make the transition to independence. They're trying to pull away from you, you know, and they, they need their own space. They need their own space to be able to express themselves and be able to, to do that, whatever that might look like. But I bring it up because I know it's, it's a real, that's a real challenge, real bugbear, bug you know, real bugbear for lots of parents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I sometimes wonder though, if it's, if it's focusing on that is easier for some parents than focusing on what might, really be the issue that they're, they're talking to people about that it's a good because it's so easy to solve the tidy the bedroom situation isn't it whereas everything else is a bit more complicated <laughs> i mean that that leads us in nicely to you another really important sort of principle almost that you, that you, that you raise in the book is this notion it's almost like pick your battles work <laughs> you know this could be a small problem that you should leave alone you know there are so many to deal with that it's actually perhaps good to sort of prioritise, you know, the things that really matter to them and are going to affect them as they make the transition to adulthood. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's kind of all the way through parenting in a way. But I think the, the thing about it, you constant, if you're observing them and you're curious about them all the time, as they as they change and as things change around them, noticing major changes and completely different kind of behavior could be a you know if, they, if their bedrooms a t terrible tip when normally they're very very tidy and the door is shut and they never come out then obviously that's a sign something you know they might have depression that something is is terribly wrong so it's just being that's what i mean about being around more because you'll notice the changes dramatic changes in behavior if, if you're around more but i think if you blow up at every single thing it's exhausting for everybody around isn't it you just have to think what's realistically going to happen if they do these things and could I just let them make that mistake and then we can talk about it afterwards <laughs> and they can tell me they've done it and why they think it was wrong and they've learned from it and they've secured a neural pathway that's a different is a changing way of thinking about things isn't it yeah I do think pick your battles is really one of the top five things to do as a parent of a teenage girl because they feel things incredibly intensely in a way that we don't feel them so they may you know if you if you remove a wet towel that might really piss them off <laughs> and you might wonder why that is <laughs> but they're feeling it and you know it's, it's got a different significance so just you know that i do think if you just work out where to go off and where not to go off and just walk away so you know walk away from it you know set, set some boundaries. i do think boundaries are important and i will often say to my girls i can't if you want to speak to me like that, I don't want to talk about it now. I'll talk, we'll talk about it later and I'll walk away or go out to, 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 you know, not have that battle over that. But then some things that you've been very firm about and the boundary's been pushed or broken, then you just, you, we need to sit and talk about it. And that's, this is how we're going to talk about it. Yeah. I mean, one of those that, you know, again, massive issue for parents. I mean, it's just, you know, pervasive, almost endemic now, I think, in sort of teenage populations, uh, you know, scre screens and social media and gaming and you know again an issue that we that we that we deal with on a kind of daily basis with parents and 
again, you had a sort of an interesting sort of take on, on, on I mean, you set boundaries, absolutely critical, no, no screens in bed after certain times of night and, 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 you know, absolutely fantastic. But you also can see the sort of positive and the good things about screens as well, rather than it just being this sort of evil thing. I think there's a huge hysteria around screens um, as well. And that's not to downplay any parents whose children have been horrifically affected by what they've seen on social media. We're very firm. Uh, we said no phones in the room after 9 p.m. And it made us unpopular for two years. It was horrible. It was a horrible thing to go through with our two eldest children. I mean, our two younger children, we said as soon as they got the phones, you can't have the phones if you're going to have them in your room after 9 p.m. So that's a decision you deal with. If you want the phone, it's not going to... So that was, it was set. But we had to try and retrospectively set it with the older ones because they're 17 and 18. We were at the beginning of this screen um, journey. But... But I, my sense, I've done a lot, looked at a lot of the research um, and a lot of journal, big journalists have done it. A lot of researchers have done it and, you know, a lot of therapists have done it. There is no smoking gun around this social media and what they see. It is a combination of factors and the context within which these children are operating. And children develop at, a, as you know, a very different rate. So what might affect one teenager will have absolutely no effect on another teenager. Uh, and it might be affecting this teenager because her parents are going through some traumatic experience at the same time. So the context and the personality and the specific neurology of your child is so important when it comes to screens and the rules don't apply across everything. Um, I do think the social media firms should be much, much better at stopping horrible stuff reach girls and that the algorithms targeting girls with eating disorders are, and pictures that they shouldn't but then I do think you you as a parent need to help your child curate what they're looking at and the bubble that they're in you ha you need to help them and you need to be there to deal with what they're seeing um, and when they're seeing it and and l helping them moderate the time they spend on screens but just for every one I've spoken to and, and I volunteered for Shout, the um, uh, crisis text line, took a lot of um, texts and calls. I've worked with Susie Godson at Me Too, the app that helps its peer-to-peer -peer group for teenagers. They've done a ton of research. Um, there is nothing that says it, it will have the same effect and an appallingly detriment for every single teenager. It's much more complex than that. And if you blame it for everything, then what you don't do is look under the bed, as, as they say in therapy. You don't work out what else is affecting your teen's mental health to such an extent they can't really cope with what they're seeing online. I mean, I think that's, I know it's incredibly hard, incredibly hard for parents whose teenagers have been awfully affected by what they've seen online. But what else is going on, I think, needs to be, looked at within the family group. Certainly the dynamic within the family groups is something that comes up again and again as, as having as not being helpful to teenagers when they're on screens with what they're looking for online. It's such a complex area, but I think just to reassure parents it's much bigger than just what they're seeing. You know, the way they're feeling is much bigger than just what they're seeing on the screen. I suppose because I'm always thinking about it from a kind of neuroscience point of view, but the you know because you've put your boundaries in place and, you know, you're I often say this, the parents are almost acting like their sort of prefrontal cortex for them is not quite connected up yet. So you're providing some of the boundaries for them because they're not quite ready to make some of those decisions that really sort of helps hugely, you know, with managing their, but, you know, because for lots of parents where you don't have those boundaries, you don't have those, those rules in place, it can spiral out of control and become a much bigger thing than, beyond just what your intrinsic family dynamic might be. Yeah, no, that is, yes, you are, you are right. There is, you know, that I don't do a to-do list in the book of hard and fast rules, but the only thing I'm, I think is a hard and fast rule is you don't want your teenagers on their phones through the night in their rooms. <laughs> I mean, you know, we all know how things feel in the middle of the night. It's, it's, it's much worse. You just don't want, if you can set that boundary right at the beginning. Now, you know, if you haven't set that boundary, it's really difficult to then, because the moment you do, the, the reaction is completely out of proportion with what you're, what you're doing. And, you know, we had it with our girls. They were just, they were furious for two years, absolutely furious. They, you know, they said we'd made them pariahs among their friends that we didn't trust them, that it was about us not letting them grow up. It was, you know, all of those things, but it was the only thing in my head I just thought I simply can't bend on this because 
I don't we don't know enough about it we still don't know enough about it and you're right you know to be constantly in that cycle of scrolling and looking at horrendous images particularly I think also when we're, we're talking also about teenage boys and girls and the, the pornography that is now available on online for them you know even the most secure child in the most secure family with the perfect upbringing is going to find that really difficult because it resets the pathways doesn't it but you the only way to do that is to have a reasonable good boundaries that you keep to around it it's hard to retrospectively set them but I think if you you know for parents who are worried then I think they should try to do that but to look at the context of everything else that's going on as well because they they are quite good I think teenagers and we underestimate setting their own boundaries in their head once they know what makes them feel bad and we certainly noticed with our older teenagers that they would put their phones down because they had a sense that it wasn't making them feel good and you need you know what does it make you feel how does it make you feel you need to keep the lines of communication open around it I think and to and to work you need to be in and about it as well I think as a parent you need to be on social media looking at things you need to be reading about it and you know arm yourself with some knowledge on it as well I think that's incredibly advanced for them to be that self-reflective to feel that it's making them feel bad. Yeah, it's an addiction. It does feel like an addiction when you see, you know, I mean, I, we, we, we have had instances where we've had other um, teens around who've gone when they realised we won't let them have their phones after <laughs> some time. And they just, that's how addicted they are to it. They can't envisage an evening without it on. And you know, it, you know it's set up as an addictive uh, process. Um so, but it's here, and I think that's that's the thing. We can keep moaning about it and saying how awful it is, and we must push for companies to put in better um, algorithms around this for anyone who's, whose mental health can't handle it, or, or for all teenagers. But it's here, so we've got to work out how we deal with it as parents. I, I'm, so, I'm not really one for saying it's all terrible, we should ban it. it, it that's not going to help your child, because they're going to find a way at school, aren't they? They're going to find a they'll find a way to get to it (laughs) so how you've got to start arming them with the ways of dealing with it I think it's certainly easier for it will be easier for my nine and 14 year old because when they got the phones the rules were already there for them yeah so you've got the consistency there throughout yeah absolutely (laughs) another another one another one so that 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 I really enjoyed and tickled me in the book as well because we we've had this experience again lots of talking to many parents about this is spending time on holidays with with teenagers you know there's meant to be this sort of joyful experience that you think oh we're gonna go away and have this wonderful time (laughs) and it turns out at the time that it seems like they're not enjoying it any moment of it i know it's disappointing (laughs) but then you but then you had well you had some really positive insight about that as well well they have what i call retrospective gratefulness so at the time, they can't possibly, because they've gone on holiday with the wrong people. It's the most embarrassing thing in the world, going on holiday with their parents. And they've gone on holiday with the wrong people. They haven't, they're haven't. they not in control of where they're going. And then these people keep making them get up and do things. And at the time, they can't show. That was a real shock to me, because I thought, oh, we've got four children. We had four under 10 at one point. And I thought, this is just, whenever we went anywhere, it was bags of stuff and buggies and you know baby seats and all of that. And I just kept thinking, when they get older, this will be amazing and enjoyable and then actually it's it's not that enjoyable because you know they don't want to get up they have a whole set of things in their heads that they they will and won't do they consider it all a massive infringement of their um special social time where they've got huge plans to sort of stay in bed all day and do nothing (laughs) and also what you enjoy they don't enjoy and they're separating from you And they don't want you to tell them what their identity is going to be. So they don't want you to tell them that they enjoy going looking at art galleries. That's you're the last person they want to hear that from. They want to discover that themselves. I know, I think I recount in the book the just most... Also, they don't want to walk anywhere. (laughs) And if they do, they need to carry carry about 48 gallons of water. So, I mean, it's you know, it all feels out of their control. And I think the only way to look at it as a parent is to have sort of humor around it isn't it it's just a bit of a disappointing dream fantasy parental fantasy that doesn't come true I'm sure I mean that's a generalization I've had sort of some lovely weekends away but afterwards you hear them talking about it with great love of the times they've been away with you but they just can't do it at the time <laughs> I love that I didn't I, that's, a, that's a new one for me but I absolutely love that, that yeah it's fantastic <laughs> so 
to kind of sl- slightly kind of more broader point, I mean, one, one thing that's really, really important, I think, for, for parents of teens as well is, you know, you need to be kind to yourself thinking, you know, because it's such a difficult journey for, 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 for many parents. And as you say, particularly, you know, for mums of teenage girls because of that particular relationship and, you know, and, and some of the hostility that, that you experience. But- yeah, it's just the worst. Yeah. I wondered whether, you know, whatever your belief system might be, whether it's evolution or if you're religious, if it's God, what what they were actually thinking when they designed the timing of perimenopause to coincide almost perfectly with with children arriving at the most kind of confusing time in their life. <laughs> it's well, the the perimenopause to explain to people is the same as uh, same giant hormonal change as as the teenage years for, for teenage girls. So you get to any time after 40, it can start any time after 40 leading to full menopause, which is the average age of about 53. And you lose all your vital hormones. Everything is, to, it, well, it flu- they fluctuate and that's the problem. And, and estrogen is a really important hormone for brain um, development. You know, for, 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 it's like petrol for your brain, basically. Once it disappears, estrogen, testosterone, once they disappear, your brain is not functioning. And, you know, many studies have shown it's not functioning in the same way. So it has a really significant effect on your mental health I, you know it made me very depressed and, and I'd never ever experienced any depression ever in my life it makes you volatile it makes you filled with this kind of rage that almost every midlife woman who's going through the fluctuation of hormones will tell you how absolutely furious she is about everything and at the same time you've got someone who can't you know screw the lid on anything shut a door remember her keys talk to you politely <laughs> you know her hormones are just flooding in and she may be suffering all the kind of um premenstrual um cycle of hormones that are causing all sorts of things in her brain as well you know there's a lot of research around teenage girls shouldn't really be taking exams Jim, in the week before they um have their periods because their their hormones are, are rioting basically so this is all happening at the same time and i didn't think anyone i hadn't read this anywhere so you know i had my first child at 33 and um, I was sort of, you know, 45 when they started to become teenagers. So I hadn't read this kind of, you know, you, you, you don't take care of yourself at this time. You can't really take care of them. And then you just feel a complete and absolute failure for the whole time. And then the big scandal, obviously, in this country is that no one, GPs don't prescribe HRT as they're supposed to because of a mistaken, flawed survey that um, said it was a risk of breast cancer, which it isn't. And it was a survey done on a on a, an eight form of HRT not used anymore even so um, and it was on women over 65 so it's that survey that really through GPs and I completely understand why so you aren't getting any and many women aren't getting any help uh, with this you know they they are GPs aren't helping them and they're in a terribly low place and at the same time you've got a very kind of volatile other woman in the house a woman to be in the house and it's just I hadn't read that anywhere <laughs> and I just wanted to say to all the mums if you don't sort this out if you don't start to take care of yourself because a lot of doctors will offer antidepressants instead of HRT which for most women is 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 easy to take and it is a low it, there's a lower risk of taking today's HRT than drinking two glasses of wine today of breast cancer so it's quite a complicated area but if you don't care for yourself if you're not putting in the effort to get the sleep and because you lose your sleep then it's quite hard to manage a teenage girl who is rejecting you because she has to and separating from you because she has to and also there's just this sense of grief around all of it because you know I was absolutely heartbroken when my 18 year old left home for university heartbroken <laughs> and then also at the same time you're coming to the end of your time as a, as a reproductive woman who can have children it's a different stage of life and there's a sense of grief around that you're much more aware of how many years you have left to look forward to it seems to come into really sharp focus around the age of 45 and all of that you know your time is speeding up and going fast and her time is stretching out you know between the age is a 12 and 17 if you think about what your daughter is like at 12 by the time she's 17 she's a completely different person and that time has gone so fast that change has been so fast for her but you're sort of looking ahead thinking how much time have I got left with with her and I didn't think also that mums when you're in the swirl of parenting you don't realize how little time you have left and I wanted that people to take a bit of a moment when you're going to lose your rag over something to think hold on a minute, there's only a six months left of this. Maybe I won't lose my rag over that then. <laughs> maybe I <I'll, laughs> maybe I won't make a stand over that uh, because, you know, we haven't got 
this time together anymore it's really precious so i wanted to make that point in the book quite strongly and i wanted to point out that the fluctuating hormones has an extremely big effect on your brain activity as i'm sure you know it's just a really really challenging and difficult time isn't it and particularly as is the, the advice that in the uk is quite confusing and contradictory and i know that you're a big big you're a big advocate for for better understanding of perimenopause and particularly the ways that gps gps deal with it would you have a specific advice there for help helping helping I, th I think they need to go on there's a website um that a doctor called louise newson who's a big research doctor runs um where all the information is and she's and there's quite a few really brilliant books about it i think arm yourself with you know and if you can't take hrt there is a lot of lifestyle changes you can make and other medicine that could be helpful to you so just get arm yourself with the knowledge if you're feeling if a bit brain foggy, a bit depressed, you're not getting any sleep. I mean, hot flushes are the least of our worries, quite frankly, during the perimenopause time. But it, it's there are so many, there's tinnitus is a symptom, vertigo is a symptom, dizziness is a symptom. You know, you, you change shape, you, you, are, you have an inability to drink alcohol in the same way. So much changes, but there are lots of little things. And I think when that time is very busy, you can sort of think, it's nothing to do with me. This is just because life is really difficult and busy. And actually, if you, there are, there's so much you can do to make it quite good, quite quickly. And then you're in a better place to deal with all the changes you're dealing with with your teenage girls. And I, you know, and it, it's right that they should know about it. And I think also the other point I make in the book is for mums to really investigate the hormone effect on girls um, as they develop from 12 to 17, because it really can affect them. And there are there is medicine that girls can take to, to make, you know, and it's also often a sign of things that, that might need checking out. And we often ignore it and just assume, you know, I think society often assumes women need to just endure pain <laughs> in this way, because that's just natural that we should go through this. But actually there's a lot you can do to make it better and to be more helpful. And I think it's worth exploring that with your teenage girls. It's not fixing a problem for them, it's getting them to be knowledgeable about it. Yeah. And still, still not good advice and support, generally speaking, from GPs, you're finding? No, I think um, it's, it's very, uh, they're, they're not giving any training on menopause um, and perimenopause. Um, so it's very hard for GPs to know everything. But this is 51% of the population. It's 13 million women as we speak now. So it's not about knowing everything. This is about knowing something that will affect every woman so you do need to know this um it just hasn't been given the priority that it should be i think it will be now um but i think if you 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 know you're not happy get a second opinion talk to another doctor find the expert read the books you know ask for what you think will make a real difference to you and i think there's a kind of army gen x are quite angry anyway and i think there's an army of us now starting to change the narrative and i do think gps are beginning to really work out what the facts are. Um, I think probably more so here in Europe than anywhere else in the world. So it, it is changing. It's in the, the facts are getting out there and it is changing, but I think you need to be mindful of it if you've got teenagers, because it's a very challenging time all around for everybody. Yeah, I think I'd point, point uh, our listeners and watchers also to, to Lisa Moscone's work. I don't know if you've read her book. Have you had her on the podcast, actually? No, we, we had. We were going to, actually, but we've, um, we're going to wait for the paperback to come out. But yes, exactly. The same, it's the same thing. She just, you know, there's quite a lot of work going on this on the, on around, on the uh, estrogen and the effect on the fluctuating levels of it, effect on, the, on brain activity for women in midlife. And I think... Um, you know, it's it's a bit like a teenage going through all of this. You know, you're you every day is different and unexpected. <laughs> you know, and I think it's hard for women if they don't know what what's happening. And we certainly should be able to talk about it. Absolutely, yeah. So, so, so something that you I think you reflected on in the book, and I've certainly heard you or I've read you or heard you talk about before, is this sort of you know that obviously sharing some quite intimate details and and you know and a kind of inside view of your life with your with your teenage children and the husband have your teenage kids read the book would they be interested in reading the book yes they don't care <laughs> um it's that's that's such a tricky we're we're the facebook generation aren't we and that that's such a tricky it's a very tricky line to tread um and i think Certainly when I was keeping a kind of weekly diary in the papers before I overstepped the mark, I went too far, I gave too much away. And I, I really, I, it's Steve Bidolf the, who wrote Raising Girls and Raising Boys, the 
uh, Australian uh, therapist, was very, I had a very honest and open conversation with him. I just went, I did too much. And I really, I regret that, but you have to kind of move on, um, I think. And I certainly haven't shared as much as, you know, I, I would have been useful maybe. Um, but everything I do goes through the girls. Um, they see everything. They've seen the chapters. Actually, interesting, the holiday chapter was one they thought was hysterical. And they they, they ten generally tend to say, well, that never happened, as if I've made it up. <laughs> um, but, I mean, I do talk about um, my eldest daughter and uh, her sexuality and, and coming to terms with that. And, again, that's all gone through her. Um, I'm comfortable with it. It might, it might not be for, you know, this is my job. I write about parenting. Um, I mean, she's lots of experts. I'm comfortable with it. It might not be something for everybody. You know, I'm very mindful with them of, I mean, there are hardly any, ever any pictures of them anywhere. And anything I do is agreed with them. And I feel that at their age, they are mature enough to, to do that. But I think it's something we all have to think about, the sharing of all our you know in family life um without them having what they call informed consent because how can a 10 year old say yes to something they can't possibly know and you know and obviously I've been on the other side I've been I've, I've employed hundreds of young women um through my role and I will always check their social media uh before I employ them and in fact there's people I haven't even interviewed when I've looked at their social media and thought this is this wouldn't work it's so you know it lives forever all of it all of this stuff so I you know I feel comfortable I, I hope it's you know the aim of the book is to be helpful and as a journalist that you know that is a lovely thing you know especially as a journalist who's followed by a community of women who've been reading the magazines I've been editing so Elle and Cosmo sort of I've done have 20 years of an audience that's come with me and has come with me onto my social media and it's really for those women in a way that I'm writing it um because those that, that is the reason I wrote the book because I had so many women say to me why please can you you know, they have those light bulb moments. I'm sure you've had this, parents, when you tell them about the neurology and they say, really, is that what's... Oh, so she doesn't hate me then. She doesn't think I'm awful. I haven't done something terrible. And lots of women say, oh, please put it all together in a book so I can refer to it. Um, and I sort of felt that that was, you know, this is how it how it works. I'm comfortable with the privacy. Um, but as I say, it might not work for everybody. It's such a, I think it's such a powerful thing, having an alternative, sometimes biological explanation or psychological explanation, not, you know, explaining the behavior that it's not it's not you you know there's there's some actual you know some genuine biological reasons why they're behaving the way they do well there are and once you know that you can move forward and get on with it can't you and hopefully give yourself a break and give them a break the whole point is to give them a bit of a break you know exactly exactly something that i'm going to be i'll be remiss not to ask because my my, my youngest evie who generally is, you know, like, like yours, completely embarrassed of everything that I do and I do online. But she, she asked me if I, if I could ask, do you connect with te your teenage children over fashion? Because she's really, she's really into her fashion. She wants to become a fashion designer. So as soon as, as, as soon as I to to told her that you were coming on, she was like, oh, she suddenly became interested in what I was doing. <laughs> oh, you feel. Um, but that was her question. Do you, do you connect with your children over fashion? Well, it's just that this is probably one of the reasons I wrote the whole chapter called Meanagers. So I've worked in fashion. I've sat in the front row of the shows for 20 years. You know, I mean, I know people person. I know Tom Ford, I'm Tele Versace. I know all these people personally. They've been part of my career and what I do and all the young London designers. Um, and obviously I give talks at the, the schools now and again, you know, I know about fashion, that's my training. And I remember saying to my 15 year old, I'm coming in to give a talk to your sixth form about um, how to get a job in fashion. And the look of confusion on her face was something to behold. And she said, but, but what would you know about fashion? The dismissal was epic, really, quite epic. And I said, well, ev everything, really. I, mean, I know her. And she said, but you, you don't. You don't know anything about fashion. And that kind of sums up how a teenage girl views their parent. I remember talking to my, my daughter's gone to Bath University to do engineering. Um, she wants to be a car. She wants to work with cars. And I remember talking to an, another mum there and then finding out that this mum on the open day at the engineering thing was a really eminent professor of engineering, someone who'd won awards. And I said, oh, my God, that's amazing. Your daughter must be so proud that you're here. You're a bit of a star to have in the room. And she went, I'm not allowed to ask any questions. The only question I'm allowed to ask is where is the toilet? So they just don't care. <laughs> <laughs> they don't. <laughs> But, you know, it's just, I do think fashion is the most amazingly creative and wonderful, actually welcoming and accepting, 
community so anyone who wants to go into it gets my vote but they have they just they think i dress ridiculously they think i look ridiculous they think my clothes are ridiculous and, and they've never in any way displayed any pride in <laughs> in anything you know i would for their school projects i'd say this do you want this sewn into a thing because i can get giles deacon to do that for you because then they're like what no <laughs> nothing they are disinterested from the bottom of their heart in my career <laughs> They absolutely are. I get, I get it from you. So you work on the brain, is it? Oh yeah, I'm sure you know nothing about that. <laughs> yeah. What would you know? Oh uh, well, thank you so much, Lorraine. It's it's been been absolutely lovely, lovely, lovely to talk to you. And just just to finish up, if you know, lots of our, our mums listening and watching the podcast, parents of teens. What what do you think would be the single most important piece of advice? you would give to a mum of a teenage girl or of a, of a girl making starting to make that transition into the teenage years? I would say don't panic. Just relax. Make sure you look after yourself. And she can do hard, they can do hard things. Kids can do hard things. I think that's the best, you know, they can do it. Just let them do it. And they're all different and they're all developing at such a different way just be really tuned into the differences of your child and don't be overwhelmed by it just relax i think that's the main thing just just take that breath and relax <laughs> oh absolutely thank thank you so much lorraine it's been really lovely talking to you thank you ben and good luck to evie <laughs> Thanks so much to Lorraine for some really interesting insights about parenting teenage girls. Her new book, Mum, What's Wrong With You? 101 Things Only Mothers of Teenage Girls Know is available to buy from the 10th of June and is a must read for mums of teenagers. But before we finish up, a quick reminder of our free workshop we're offering on how to parent a teenage brain. On this workshop, we share the four essential strategies for parenting teenagers and you can watch the free workshop at ologyonlinecourses.com forward slash workshop. That's ologyonlinecourses.com forward slash workshop. I hope today's episode on Parenting Teenage Girls with Lorraine Candy was helpful. It's been a pleasure spending time with you and I will look forward to seeing you next time.